Hello, everyone. Our next speaker has never exactly been shy about challenging conventional thinking of the roles that aid and business should play in the fight against poverty. Please help me give a warm welcome to Mr. Michael Miller. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I'm not exactly sure if this is right, but I was told by the locals that when you come to Columbus, you're supposed to do something like OH. Wow. Woohoo! Uh, so I work for Poverty Cure and the Act Institute, and it's an initiative that promotes entrepreneurial solutions to poverty uh, rooted in the creative capacity of the human person. And so we have about 160 partners. Some of them are here. I think our next speaker is a partner. And uh, we're finishing a seven-part video curriculum and a documentary as well. So I'm happy to be here uh, talking about entrepreneurship because usually I have to convince people that entrepreneurship is good. And here it's exciting to be around people <clears throat> who are already so enthusiastic about entrepreneurship. So I'm going to talk about three things. I don't have very much time. But I'm going to talk about briefly the foundations of entrepreneurship, the missing middle, and human creativity. I was going to talk more, but when you're super handsome, like me, um, it's hard to concentrate. So I'm going to show you a video <laughs> instead. OK? So um, the first thing I want to say is that entrepreneurship, we talk about it a lot. Everybody's excited about it. But sometimes we forget about the foundations of entrepreneurship. Hernando de Soto said the developing world is teeming with entrepreneurs. But why is it that they don't <clears throat> come up the way that they do in the developed world, the United States or Europe? And that's partially because of the foundations of entrepreneurship. But we take, these are things we take for granted, things like private property, rule of law, freedom of association. That's the freedom to start a business. Hernando de Soto did a study. It took 289 days to start a little business in Peru. Okay? And that's working eight hours a day. Four lawyers were going around trying to start it up. Um, rule of law is going into a business knowing that, you know what? I don't care that the business partner's brother-in-law is the judge. Because I know it's going to be fair. This is a rule of law, not a rule of men. And there's been studies that show that the correlation between development and rule of law is much higher than, say, for that of development and democracy. Private property, we take it for granted, but you know that in some places, 70% of the land has no title. People don't know who owns the land. So can you imagine you're about to develop your farm or develop your business, but you don't own it? And so what happens is, Schumpeter says maybe about 16% of the population is entrepreneurs. There's debate over that. But anyway, these entrepreneurs, some of the most, the greatest ones will jump out, and they'll be able to do it anyway. But a lot of people who are naturally entrepreneurs aren't able to because they lack these foundations. Also, families and communities, civil society, churches, and a culture of trust. Um, let me say one last thing, and that's free exchange. Now, sometimes people can think, well, I mean, doesn't competition kind of hurt the poor? Shouldn't we worry about competition? And, and that's understandable. But in all the work we've done and in interviews we've done <coughs> with people, one thing is clear. The poor want access to markets. And actually, perhaps surprisingly, it's the poorest of the poor who need free and competitive markets. Why? Because they lack the political and social and economic contacts to navigate a system that's run by governments and big business. So what happens is we sometimes mistake free markets for managerial capitalism, like we have here in the United States, or oligarchic capitalism, where big business and government work together to set up regulations. Right? And so the poorest of the poor, the small, the medium, the micro-entrepreneurs, they don't have lobbyists in Washington or, or, or Lima or, or anywhere. They are trying to struggle. And so the poorest of the poor really need free and competitive markets in this system of rule of law with justice where they have the opportunity to develop their skills. And so these are very complex, but you can go to povertycure.org. There's my advertisement povertycure.org, um, and learn more about these things and watch videos. We've, as we said, we've, we've done about 150 interviews all over the world, and you can hear people from the developing world talk about property rights, rule of law, the importance of these things at povertycure.org. Um, so the next thing is sometimes we think about, I want to talk about the missing middle. So that was my first point. Foundations. Next thing is, sometimes we think about entrepreneurs in the developing world like this man, or a market woman, right, who's the micro-entrepreneur. Now, micro-enterprise you know, can and has done a lot of good. 
Um, it's not the solution to poverty. Sometimes we like microenterprise because it's something small, we can relate to it, it's exciting, and that's good. And, and, and I think that this development of microenterprise has been a force to allow a lot of the poor access to capital that they've never had. But if you look at high income countries, what do you see? If you look at this graph, you see most com co companies in the developed world, in high income countries, about 70% or so of GDP and, and employment comes from the small and medium sector. But if you look at the developing world in low income countries, you see that it's lacking. This is called the missing middle. So while we have to get micro enterprises, we actually need to focus on small and medium entrepreneurs as well because they create jobs. This, this man is Alex George. I met him in Haiti. Um, and he and his business partners produce solar panels in Haiti. They're partnering with companies in, in the developed world. And he not only, he's one of the small medium entrepreneurs. And what does he do? He actually provides jobs for people who come out of places like Siti Soleil, which is not very far away. Some of you know that the United Nations ranked Siti Soleil as the most dangerous place on earth in 2006. This is a, a place where entrepreneurship is difficult. So many people are not entrepreneurs, but they need jobs. And so the small medium sector, like it does in Europe and the United States and Japan, is extremely important. So I encourage you to think about that. Um, let me make one caution about social entrepreneurship. We get excited about social entrepreneurship, and I'm delighted because for many years, the theme has been, you know, let's give foreign aid and charity, and we're going to, if we give stuff to the developing world, we can end poverty. But poverty, as you know, doesn't end when we give stuff. Poverty ends when individuals and families create wealth for themselves, their families, and their communities. So my caution with social entrepreneurship is that we have to be careful that our social entrepreneurship activities don't, especially when they're kind of subsidized by donations, that they don't end up crowding out local entrepreneurs like Alex. So if we're going to give away solar panels to Haiti, are we crowding out a local businessman? If we, even if we sell it on a subsidized model, social entrepreneurship is very fancy, it's very hip, and it's cool to be a social entrepreneur, and it's exciting. But if we all work on a partnership model, it becomes much better. And so the thing I worry about, and I put out to you to think about, is we don't want a social entrepreneurship where the poor stay poor and the rich get hipper. We want a social entrepreneurship where the rich and the poor work to, with one another in partnerships so that people can create long-term sustainable development in their own communities with partnerships. And there's a place for partnerships, so I encourage you to think about that. My final point is human creativity. And here you see Alex is an example of human creativity. This is the foundational aspect of what entrepreneurship is about. Human beings are creative. Right? We, we're, we're, we have the ability to use our minds to transform things and create wealth and prosperity for our families and communities. Now, oftentimes when we think about poverty, we will accidentally perhaps think about poverty and people in the developing world as burdens. People, you know, they, they're, they're, they're the cause of poverty. And so um, we think of this because of an economic fallacy called the zero-sum game. And that, that's the idea that the economy is a pie. And if I have more, then you have less. If he has more, then she has less. But that's an economic fallacy. And entrepreneurship is the answer to why it's an economic fallacy. Because entrepreneurs can create new wealth. They can create and be innovative. And so I'm so excited about alleviating poverty through entrepreneurship because it focuses on that creative dimension of the human person. Now, missing this creative dimension has serious consequences, real consequences. We have spent billions of dollars trying to reduce numbers of population, encouraging people to have small families. Because people think, oh, if there are fewer people, there'll be more stuff to go around. But what has happened, ladies and gentlemen? When people have small families, what happens? Anybody know? They choose to have what kind of child? Boys, which means there is what the New York Times has called the daughter deficit, or what The Economist magazine has called gendercide. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a war on women. 
and it comes from bad economics, bad anthropology, missing the creative dimension of the person, and missing the entrepreneurial nature. Women, these girls, are not burdens. They are potential creators, potential entrepreneurs, mothers and sisters that have the capacity to be contributing to economies. And so the other problem is, ladies and gentlemen, men especially, what do you think will happen 25 years from now when there's all these men and there are no women around? Do men like a world without women? Absolutely not. Okay? Even God doesn't like that. God created man and he said, this is not good for man to be alone. Okay? So even God knows we need girls. All right? So I think it's very important, and this is why entrepreneurship is important. So thank you for that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now show you a very brief video, um, and I hope you enjoy the video, and I encourage you to get involved. Uh, join us uh, at Poverty Cure. You can like us on Facebook. We're almost to 200,000 likes, so you can help push us over the edge. Um, and also, uh, if you're an organization that's interested in what we're doing, take a look at our website, visit our, um, our partner page, and if you agree with what we're doing, we encourage you to, uh, to join with us and, and help promote and transform the terms of the debate. And we don't agree on everything. There's a lot of debate among our partners, but we want to transform the terms of the debate to entrepreneurial solutions to poverty. So now I'm going to be super high tech. I'm going to show you this video. And uh, you can look at this and then also uh, look for our, our upcoming um, documentary and curriculum. Let me get this to zero. I'm super high tech, if you can tell. Another increase in poor nation aid. The World Bank said yesterday that it would almost triple lending this year to help prevent a, quote, human crisis in developing countries amid the turmoil in financial markets. Machiavelli said, the reason there will be no change is because the people who stand to lose from change have all the power. And the people who stand to gain from change have none of the power. Machiavelli was describing the global aid system today. We can't continue to talk about the tragedy of poverty and not talk about aid. Over two trillion dollars have been spent on aid. Aid creates dependency. More aid and more aid and more aid. We've seen that aid has subsidized dictators, encouraged inefficiency. Most of the money for aid doesn't actually get to the poor. Aid has delayed the development of, uh, of business in Africa. It has kept Africa behind. It becomes a way of colonizing the economies of the poor countries, a system of economic slavery. You create that parental relationship. It's patron-client, it's master-slave, it's all broken. These are the strategies of the last 50 years, and they failed for 50 years, and they're going to continue to fail. It's time to change. African nations today agreed together and say no more aid. I tell you they can grow slowly but they can grow. Economic transformation in the long term come from locally run, locally owned businesses. We need to transform our good intentions into things that actually work. And what works is allowing these individual human beings, creating the image and likeness of God, to create value and prosperity for themselves. We are working to train people into entrepreneurship and be disciples of God in transforming their own nation. I've seen that. 
I've seen that through my business. Nobody owes us anything. You don't expect the whole world to be able to address your own problems. We are here to meet up front these challenges we face. Entrepreneurship should become something that is the language and the life of our day-to-day -day people. To create capacities in the people, to empower them to be able to stand on their own. People have lots of energy, lots of capacity. Business is the normative way in which people rise out of poverty, not state-to-state -state aid, not the largesse of politicians and bureaucrats. It might not be very romantic to think that it's just humdrum business, but it's true. These people are the engine of growth. They are changing slums into cities. Instead of training job seekers, we train job makers. A sense of independence, a sense of human dignity. Confidence. Knowledge. Empowerment. Opportunity. Character. Responsibility. Hard work. Vision. Self-esteem. The new moral purpose. Abundance of life. Economies can grow. Anything is possible. And it's high time we stop telling our people they can't do it. Yes, we shall do it in the name of God. There's a false notion that poor countries are poor because rich countries are rich. And that somehow there's a, re a justice requirement that wealthy countries have to transfer money from developing countries' taxpayers to developing countries. They think they owe the poor people to give them money without thinking about how they are going to use this money. What Africans need are not handouts. What all people need are the foundations to allow them to live out their freedoms and live out their responsibilities, to fail and to succeed. Having a heart for the poor isn't hard. Can we have a mind for the poor? Can you really relate to the poor on a one-to-one -one basis? As equals, as partners, as colleagues. Can we allow them to put the locus of responsibility for their own future on themselves and then be willing to be guided by their vision? And if you give people that foundation, then they're going to create success, they're going to create wealth that no state could ever create. Private sector has the bigger role and it grows and grows and we begin to drive the bottom of the pyramid the other way around, we flip it around because it is possible. It's worked in other societies. Um, it can work for Africa. Whether you are born in the richest family in the world or in the poorest family in the world, you have the same capability as a human being. It's a question of how you unleash that energy that is packed into you. So small and medium-sized enterprises are a critical part in the development process. Job creation, employers who provide income for families who can take uh, whole communities out of poverty. And that's what markets are, they're networks of human relationships where people get together and solve problems closest to them. It's time to move the locus of power away from the aid industry into individual communities, individual countries where they can choose their own strategy to create prosperity. The purpose of prosperity is not itself. The purpose of prosperity is to create stronger societies. We need to be able to move from aid to production, from existing to living. It is the way it was meant to be for us to leverage our communities out of poverty. People have the dignity of putting food on their table, shelter, health is provided, education is provided for their children. Good intentions don't end poverty. Enterprise and freedom end poverty. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks to uh, APTE for the invitation. And again, I encourage you to look at povertycure.org and um, stay in contact with us. And uh, we're trying to learn more all the time. So if you have things to teach us, it's part of creating this, um, this, uh, this dialogue about how to think in new ways about entrepreneurship and wealth creation. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks.